And they crucified him. Rarely have four words been more pregnant with meaning. Because veiled within that brief clause is nestled our big idea for today. The cross, though a horrible and cruel instrument of death, became for us a magnificent portal to life. Now that's a, that's a paradox, isn't it? Paul, as I mentioned in our introduction, 1 Corinthians 1.23 says, but we preach Christ crucified. In other words, as silly as it may seem to you, that is what we preach. A stumbling block to Jews, and it was. And folly, bordering on a joke to Gentiles. A crucified Savior? Really? But things are different in our culture today, aren't they? Because we've, we've sanitized the cross. We've domesticated it. We gold-plate it and wear it around our necks on chains. Unthinkable in the first century. So let's consider the magnificence of the cross. In what ways is the cross truly magnificent? It is magnificent in its prophetic intentionality. The crucifixion of Jesus was not an accident. It wasn't simply some miscarriage of justice for the Savior of the world. It was God's plan all along, even before time began, long before Adam and Eve disregarded God's command in the Garden of Eden. It, it, it wasn't simply injustice. It was God's intent all along. And oh, the Father didn't spring it on Jesus. The Father didn't somehow impose it on the Son, but rather in the halls of eternity in sacred counsel, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit authored this plan together that would display his glory and pay the price of our redemption. It's also magnificent in its power. One might suppose that it would have made far more sense for Jesus to come as a conquering king, more so than a, a suffering servant. But remember, God has a story to tell. We often think of God as, as strictly as a judge or whatever, but God is an author. He's creative. He's a poet. He tells stories, and he's written you and me into the story. And he's written this grand narrative. And he utilizes paradox, just like any good author would do. That's why, like, just like we sang before, he sent a savior who would be Lamb of God and later Lion of the tribe of Judah. First coming in weakness, second coming in glory and in power. We preach a message that to the world in many ways sounds stupid. But it's because of the inherent power of that message and the fact of the death on a cross that lends this ir almost irrational power to it. Verse 18, Paul goes on to say, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. All of my sins, all of my violations of the law were written on a certificate and Jesus took them and nailed them to the cross and then it was overwritten with those words, canceled or paid in full. It is finished, which he declared from the cross. And that is why we preach Christ crucified. You see, the cross is magnificent in its prophetic intentionality. It is magnificent in its power, and it's magnificent in its effect. It is the cross that paradoxically gives me life in Christ. It is through the cross that both Jew and Gentile, once poles apart and implacable enemies, are made into brothers. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16 say, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Jew and Gentile hated each other. Jews considered Gentiles to be fit only to fuel the fires of hell and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. 
Thus, in keeping with God's love of paradox, the cross on the one hand slays, on the other hand it quickens to life. You may be familiar with the great classic hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Have you heard it? Do you know it? I take, O cross, thy shadow for my abiding place. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face. Content to let the world go by, to know no shame or loss. My sinful self, my only shame, my glory, all the cross. I i